Good afternoon from Berlin. Welcome to Rewriting the Future Festival, launch of the State of Artistic Freedom 2021 report session from Free Muse. We will reveal this, uh, we will reveal their annual report. You can watch us live on the website rewritingthefuture.org and on YouTube channel of Allianz Kulturstiftung and on the Facebook page of Rewriting the Future. Free Muse is an independent international non-governmental organization advocating for freedom of artistic expressions and cultural diversity. On this session, we will meet cultural practitioners, artists, writers from all around the world, talking about subjects of freedom of expression and discussing it, especially during these hard times. We will kick this session with Shahid Al Alam, photojournalist, photo teacher, and social activist, talking to Bawal singer Rita Diwan from Bangladesh. Enjoy. Hola a todos, todas, todes. Mi nombre es Manuel del Alcántara, artista contemporáneo de las artes visuales en Cuba, activista por los derechos humanos, los derechos culturales, todos, y, y opinador principal del Movimiento San Isidro. El arte en Cuba y la cultura en Cuba en estos momentos está muriendo. Tras 62 años, 60 años de vivir en una dictadura donde cada expresión, cada gesto, cada canción que te escriba como músico o cada cuadro que tú quieras pintar tiene que obedecer a una doctrina, tiene que obedecer a lo que, a lo, a lo que dice un dirigente como Cuba, el CEO Fidel Castro, después pasó Raúl o pasó Díaz Canel. Si tu obra o tu, tu canción o tu poema muestra la realidad concreta en la cual tú vives, que es una realidad de pobreza, una realidad de violencia, una realidad que es igual que cualquier realidad de Latinoamérica, con su, con su diferencia. Si tú muestras eso en tu obra, y eso no es precisamente lo que el régimen quiere eh, mostrar para, el, para la opinión internacional, eso te cuesta que tu familia tenga miedo a hablar contigo. Imagínense que tu mamá y tu papá tengan miedo que tú seas su hijo. Imagínense que tu amigo tenga miedo de que tú seas su amigo. Tu familia tenga miedo que tú seas su familia. Tu novia o tu novio, tu, tu, tu pareja, tenga miedo de tú ser su novio. Eso empezando por ahí. Segundo, como dice Tana Bruguera, vivimos en un sistema donde no solamente es la censura de una institución, o la censura de una galería, o que un libro no te lo publican. Estamos hablando de cuando tu obra conecta con la realidad y logra darle soluciones a la gente, te cae todo un aparato militar, de inteligencia militar, para matarte, literalmente a nivel social. Y tú dirías, pero en otras realidades del mundo a los activistas, a los periodistas los secuestran y los matan. Es que aquí nacemos muertos. Aquí la gente no sabe exigir su derecho. Aquí la gente vivimos como fantasmas, vivimos como muertos, vivimos como zombies, sin derechos, sin saber eh, que podemos eh, optar por una vivienda digna, que podemos optar eh, por simplemente vivir en un mundo que no sea lo que, dije, lo que dice una persona. Y si, no, y si vas en contra de eso, que te cueste prisión, inclusive la muerte. Y eso es, significa ser artista en nuestro en Cuba. Significa que mi trabajo, mi dibujo, es categorizado de terrorismo. Significa que mi trabajo de arte, de performance, me ha costado alrededor de 40 veces en un calabozo. Me ha costado prisión. Me ha costado tenerme que, tener que dejar de ver a mis hijos con miedo a que mis hijos los puedan botar de la escuela. Y todo eso está justificado por parte del régimen con que atentas contra, contra su revolución. En esa realidad vivimos nosotros, los artistas cubanos. La máxima expresión de la represión cultural en Cuba es el decreto 349. Es un decreto que el régimen firmó en el año 2018, donde te impide, como artista independiente, tener una voz propia, tener un espacio independiente para ti, y te pena inclusive con prisión, pues tú en tu casa puedes mostrar una obra tuya. Invitar a cuatro amigos. Búscalo. ¿Cómo podemos ayudar al arte independiente y el arte que activa contenido en Cuba y el arte que verdaderamente tiene una posición política, tiene una posición de cambio en Cuba? Y que estamos hablando simplemente de un performance, un artista, un, un fotógrafo, eh, un pintor, una poeta, un poeta, un músico, que simplemente lo que hacen es que en, su, en su música, en sus canciones, en su obra, reflejar la realidad de proponer cambios, proponer cambios para bien, desde la paz, desde el amor. ¿Cómo podemos ayudar a esas personas que el régimen va donde ellos y le acaba con la vida? 
muchos curadores, muchos coleccionistas, muchos eh, directores de museos, mucho, muchos editores de libros, eh, personas del mundo de la música, cuando entran a, a, al país sí, casi siempre quieren negociar con el sistema a través de las instituciones del sistema y se dejan contar todas las historias que el sistema quiere contar. ¿Qué cosa significa ser independiente para el sistema? ¿Qué significa ser activista por los derechos humanos por el sistema? Todo, la mayoría de las personas que entran a Cuba eh, caen en el cuento del sistema. Nosotros los independientes tenemos que luchar contra la represión de un aparato militar, pero también para promover nuestra obra. No sé, nosotros también queremos ser artistas, queremos también que nuestra obra, nuestro, nuestro, nuestro mensaje, que es un mensaje también universal de amor, de apertura, de entradas, de, 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 de familia, queremos también que el mundo se conozca como pudiera tener el sueño cualquier artista. Y tras vivir en una dictadura donde tenemos que gastar el 80% para poder hacer nuestro arte, gastar el 80% de la energía con, con tropas militares, con militares, con, con asesinos, literalmente psicólogos, lo único que pedimos es que nos reconozcan, que nos busquen y nos promuevan nuestra obra también a nivel internacional. Gracias, estamos conectados. We, we apologize for the wrong video that um, it's supposed to be Shahid Al Alam, but we, we listened to the Cuban artist Luis Manuel Orterio Alcantara. And now we're going to listen to Shahid Al Alam, photojournalist, teacher, and social activist talking to Bawal singer Rita Diwan from Bangladesh. Talking to Rita Diwan, uh, she's a very well-known Bawal singer from Bangladesh who was persecuted for having offended religious sentiments. Um, stay with us. Ita pa. Apna tu Bawal gan gan, gola chayda gan gan. Hatske yala pe, amra mon khule kotha kum. Awashi. Shai khante ke shuru kori. AJ Baul Gan. I'm not the Gan Hishabu Guti. Apna Cassetta or Tataki. Amar Cassi or two, Jara Shadu, Jara Baul Huisin, Baul or two, Bartho, Batash, Ulorto Shon Nankari, or Tat, Batashir Shon Nankari. Amar Vitore, J Batashta Zai Mung Ashi. We Batashi Shon Nankari, Kurtobe, or Tat Nijikin is a China. जाना এখন তো আমি দোষী হয়ে গেছি শুধু বাংলাদেশ না সারা বিশ্বের মধ্যে দোষী হয়ে গেছি আমি বলবো যে সরকার যে আমার নামে চারটা মামলা হইছে এটা তো অবশ্যই সরকার দেখছে তাই না এখন আমি এতটুকু বলতে চাই যে আমরা তো বাউল গান করে খাই আমরা তো সত্য কথা বলি মানুষের কথা বলি নবী রাসূলের কথা বলি হাদিস কোরআনের বাইরে বলি না আমার সত্য কথা বলে যদি আমার মামলা খেতে হয় তাহলে যারা আরো বাউল আছে যারা দার্শনিক কবি তারপরে হলো লেখক ও সাংবাদিক যারা আরো গভীর থেকে সত্য কথা বলবে তাদের অবস্থাটা কি হবে আমার অভিজ্ঞতা যখন আমি লুকায় থাকি একদিন দুই দিন না তো বেশ কয়েকদিন আমার মন হয় এর সাথে জেল খাটাও ভালো লোকে থাকার সাথে রাস্তাঘাটে থাকার সাথে এর সাথে কারাগারে থাকলে মন হয় আমার আমার তাও ভালো হইতো মানে আমার এত কষ্ট হইছে যখন চারটা মামলা হয়ে গেল আমার নামে তারপরে থেকে তো সরকার প্রত্যেকটা থানায় সারা বাংলাদেশে মেসেজ দিয়ে দিছে রিতা দেওয়ানের নামে কোনো পারমিশন চলবে না অন্য শিল্পী নেন সমস্যা নেই পারমিশন দিয়ে দেবো কিন্তু রিতা দেওয়ানের নামে কোনো পারমিশন চলবে না অনেক বায়না রাখা ছিল সত্তর আশিটা বায়না রাখা ছিল কিন্তু কোনো গানে গান করতে পারি নাই ওই সিজন থেকে এই সিজন পর্যন্ত কারণ আমার ফ্যামিলিটা চলে গানের উপর আর আমার গানটা যদি বন্ধ হয়ে যায় আমার চলা কিভাবে চলতে পারি বা কিভাবে থাকতে পারি এটা তো আপনি অবশ্যই বুঝতে পারেন একটা তো পেট চলা স্বাভাবিক আমাদের প্রত্যেকেরই লাগে আপনার সংসারে চলতে হয় তো মনেরও তো খোরাক লাগে হ্যাঁ অবশ্যই মনের খোরাক যেখানে গান হয়েছে 
ওই কানটাকে মানে ই করে দিয়ে গান শুনছি কোথায় যদি আশেপাশে গান হইছে একটু বরকাটা পড়ে গিয়ে ওই রাস্তায় দাঁড়িয়ে গান শুনছি একটু গান শুনি কারণ আমরা তো বাউল কারণ গান করে খাই এটা তো আমাদের আত্মার খোরাক একটা মানুষ যদি এক বেলা না খাইলে যেমন অসুস্থ হয়ে যায় আমরা বাউলরা এরকম হয়ে যাই একদিন বা এক মাস গান না করতে পারলে যে এরকম হয়ে যায় গান গান হলো আমাদের একটা আত্মার খোরাক অসুস্থ হয়ে যায় আপনার ধরেন এর মাঝখানে আমরা এই আপনার কেসটাকে নাকচ করার জন্য একটা চেষ্টা চলছিল এবং সেটা করতে গিয়ে আপনার একটা বিশেষ অভিজ্ঞতা হয়েছিল কি হয়েছিল এবং আপনার সেটা করতে গিয়ে আপনার কাছে কি রকম লাগছিল চিটাগাঙের যে মামলাটা মানে বলার কোনো ভাষা নাই এখনও বলার ভাষা নাই তখন ভাষা ছিল না আমি হারিয়ে ফেলছিলাম সব ভাষা কারণ যখন আমাকে বলতেছে যে আপনাকে আমি কেস উঠাইতে পারি তবে আপনি মুসলমান হইতে হবে আমাকে কেন আমি কি মুসলমান না কয় হ্যাঁ আপনি তো নাস্তিক হয়ে গেছেন আপনি তো ইহুদি হয়ে গেছেন আপনার সাথে কথা বলে আমাদের চলে না তারপরে কথা বলি কারণ আমার আসল বলছে একটা মেহমান আসলে তার সাথে ভালোভাবে কথা বলতে হবে আমি কই মানে তখন আমার মানে কষ্ট লাগতেছে খুব যে কি রে আমাকে আবার মুসলমান বানাইতে হবে আমাকে কেন আমাকে কীভাবে মুসলমান বানাবেন আপনি মুসলমান না আমি তো মুসলমান কন না আমি নামাজ পড়ি রোজা করি আমি শরীয়তে রায়ন মেনে চলি আমার বাবা মা চোদ্দ পুরুষ মুসলমান আমি গান করি তাতে কি হয়েছে আমার পালা ক্ষেত্রে আমার অভিনয় ক্ষেত্রে যেটা চলে আসছিল আমি সেটা বলছিলাম আমি তো সঠিকভাবে ডাইরেক্টলি আল্লাহকে শয়তান বলি নাই আগে পিছনে যে কথাগুলি ছিল ওই কথাগুলি যারা ইউটিউবার কথাগুলি কেটে কেটে মাঝখানতে নিয়ে নিয়ে তাদের চ্যানেলকে দাঁড়া করানোর জন্য তারা টাকা কামাই করার জন্য এইভাবে তারা সারছে আসলে আমি ওইভাবে বলি না আমার ফুল রেকর্ডিংটা আপনার শোনেন আমি বলতেছি কয় শুনছি আপনি তো বলছেন তারপর আপনি এই মুসলমান হইতে হবে আমাকে কীভাবে কয় তো বা পড়বেন আপনি কলেমা পড়বেন আমাকে কেন এগুলো পড়তে হবে কেন আমি পড়ি না কয় এখন পড়লে সমস্যা কি আমাকে এখন পড়লে আমি তো সর্বক্ষণ পড়ি আমি স্টেজে যাওয়ার সময় পড়ি শুয়ে থাকি তখন পড়ি যখন ঘুমায় যাই তখন তো বা পড়ি রবির কালেমা পড়ে তারপর আমি ঘুমাই যাই এখন পড়তে হবে লোক দেখানো বিষয়টা কি হয় এইটাই আপনাকে করতে হবে যখন এটা বলল একটা হুজুর ডাক দিয়ে নিয়ে আসলো আমি মানে বুকটা ফেটে কান্না আসতেছে যে আমি একজন মুসলমান হয়ে আবার নতুন করে উনি ওনার মতন একজন মানুষ আমাকে আবার সে আমাকে মুসলমান বানাইতেছে দিছে হ্যাঁ সে আমাকে কলেমা পড়াবে একজন হুজুর ডাক দিয়ে নিয়ে আসলো আর দুইজন অ্যাডভোকেট ছিলেন তারপরে আমি আর উনি চারজন ঘরের মধ্যে ওই উনি যে মোল্লা ওই মোল্লা আর কি বলতেছে আপনি তবা পড়েন সবাই সাথে সাথে বললাম তো বললাম কিন্তু তখন আমার চোখের পানিটা চলে আসছে এটা বাস্তব কথা কারণ আমি তো মুসলিম তাই না মানে আমার আনুষ্ঠানিকভাবে এটা করতে হবে আমার ভেতরে যদি শয়তান কি থাকে বাহিরে লোক দেখানো এটা করলে হবে না আর আমি বাহিরে যাই করে আমার ভেতর যদি পরিষ্কার থাকে সেটাই তো করতে হবে তখন আমার আমার অ্যাডভোকেট সাহেব বলেন আপনি করেন সমস্যা নেই ওনারা আনুষ্ঠানিকভাবে ওনারা করবে করুক তখন ওইভাবে করে আসলাম তবে আমার মনে হয় সবচেয়ে আমার কষ্টের দিন ওইটাই ছিল আমার খুব খারাপ লাগছিল যে আমি একজন মুসলমান মানুষকে পুনরায় আবার এটা করতে হইল ওরা ওরা আমাকে কত ছোট করল বলো আপনি হুদি হয়ে গেছেন আপনাকে আবার কলমা পড়াইতে হবে তোমার পড়াইতে হবে এই কথাটা বলছিল তখন আপনি তো নিজে ভুক্তভোগী এই কষ্টের ভিতর দিকে আছেন কিন্তু আপনার নামে যে এই অ্যারেস্ট করার কথা হয়েছে এটার কারণে অন্যরা যারা গান গায় আরও তো অনেক শিল্পী আছে তাদের উপর কি প্রভাব পড়বে আপনি মনে করেন আমি মনে করি যে আমার উপরে যেটা প্রথমে চলে আসছে তাদের উপরে তো পড়তে পারে পড়বে না যে এরকম তো কোনো কথা না যেহেতু আমার উপরে চলে আসছে তাদের উপরে যে তাদের উপরে পড়বে শুধু তারা না বাউলরা না এখানে আরও সাহিত্যিক কবি যারা আছেন যারা ছবি আঁকেন যারা সাংবাদিক এদের উপরেও আসবে আমার মনের এটা ভাবনা যে তা আমার উপরে চলে আসছে তো এই যে ডিজিটাল নিরাপত্তা আইনে ডিজিটাল নিরাপত্তা আইনে জামার নামে যে একটা মামলা হলো এটা হলো কেন এটা আমার একটু জানার দরকার কেন হইল এটা আমি তো খারাপ কিছু বলি নাই আমি তো অশ্লেষ কোনো কাজ করি নাই আমি তো খারাপ কোনো কিছু বলি নাই আমার ছিল প্রশ্ন এটা সাল সালম সরকারের কাছে যে কেন এটা হইল 
যে উনি একটা গান করছিলেন নিজের ইশকে নিজে পড়ো আর এই গানটার মধ্যে ছিল যে নিজের ইচ্ছায় নিজেই প্রকাশ হলো নিজের স্বপ্ন দেখছিল কথার মধ্যে বলছিলেন তা আমি বলছিলাম যে আমরা আমাদেরকে স্বপ্ন দেখায় শয়তানি আমেরিকা লন্ডন জাপান কুয়েত ভারত অনেক রাষ্ট্রে চলে যায় কিন্তু চেতন মেয়ে দেখি সেইখানে তাই আপনাকে শয়তান স্বপ্ন দেখালে আবার কোন শয়তানে তাহলে আপনি বলতে কোনো আল্লাহ নেই কোনো শয়তানও নেই আপনি বলছেন যে শয়তান আমার আমি আমার স্বপ্ন ছিল এইটা ছিল আমার প্রশ্ন আপনি বলবেন কিন্তু ওইটা না ধরে মাঝখানতে ওই যে শয়তানি শয়তান এটা কাইটা নেই এইভাবে এইভাবে ওরা সুন্দর করে অবশ্যই শোনাব শেষ দিয়ে ঢাইলা দিলি রে ও রাধা কলঙ্কিনি কয়া থ্যাংক ইউ শহীদ লালম অ্যান্ড রীতা দিওয়ান These are difficult times, pandemic times. We are welcoming our guests over the screens and we are facing these challenges to have them live here with us in Berlin. All along with the issues of connectivity and technology raise the challenge more. But we are glad to have them, to have them here with us over video records. Please welcome with me Dr. Sirak Plipat, Free Muse, Executive Director, presenting to you 2021 report. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the State of Artistic Freedom Report 2021. It's a pleasure to introduce this report at the beginning of the Rewriting the Future Festival here in Berlin. I thanks in particular the Alliance Cultural Stiftung for this wonderful partnership. I also would like to thank the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency and Friedwood Norway for their support uh, for this research. The year 2020 has been extremely difficult years for artists and cultural workers. Not only that their livelihood has been taken away from them due to cancellations of their work, their freedom to express themselves, their right to create has been limited to the level that we haven't seen before. And this happened in the context where nationalism and populism continue to grow in many parts of the world. Uh, the many of the governments, political parties in power continue to swing to the right in terms of their political stands and very often on the economic also. This has resulted in an increasingly high number of restrictions of artistic freedom. We saw last year, for example, um, the number of artists being killed increased by almost double, from 9 to 17. Imprisonment of artists has increased by 15%, from 71 to 82 artists and people. Prosecution has been increased by almost by over fourfold, from 23 to 109, and over 100 of artists continue to be detained for various reasons. We continue to monitor situation of artistic freedom from around the world. Last year, we monitor over 1,200 cases. Of these cases, we managed to verify 968 cases. This is sufficient for us to identify patterns um, and trends that we have seen that happen during the pandemic year. So let me go through the main findings of this research. We found that there has still been a very high number of violations of artistic freedom in almost all category of arts. And this affects men, women, children, and everyone who has the right to express themselves artistically. Looking at violation by category, we found, for example, visual arts and music has been on the forefront of the art form that has been restricted. They shared 
at the, the top at 24% each, followed by films at 23%, literature 12%, theatre 9%, and multiple forms of art at 6%. It's important to point out that visual arts normally has not been on the top two, but this year it has come on the top. And this is mainly because of a visual artist, uh, particularly a cartoonist, has been one of the prime targets during the pandemic year due to their work of questioning, criticizing and opposing government policy, both related to lockdown and those that are uh, expressed in generally, not directly related to COVID-19. And this gives the overall quite a grim picture when it comes to the spread of violations into art forms. Looking at the level of imprisonment, this has also increased roughly by 15% compared to the previous year. And we've seen quite a widespread of countries that continue to prosecute and imprison artists. Starting from Sudan, that uh, has 11, has imprisoned artists in Iran, 8, Myanmar, 7, Belarus, following the uprising and protests on the street, many uh, of those protesters are artists and those who use art to stand up during the protest uh, of the election. China remained at 7, uh, Turkey, 7, Egypt, 6, and Russia, 6. But when we look at what's the main reason for imprisoning artists, we found that mostly they are due to artists getting active in expressing themselves with the political system and political development in their countries. For some, it is quite directly because they criticize government for doing so. For others, it's due to their criticism, their opposing of COVID-19 restriction and the usual uh, rationale for restricting artistic freedom often come in terms of insulting heads of state or insulting state symbols. Um, restriction also has expands into artists when they take part in political system, and that's including joining protests, which they have the right to do so. It's also notable that women artists has been targeted for imprisoning in the past year with a rather high number of 20%. And this involving um, women, especially when they're creating arts on the feminist themes or when they're questions about reproductive rights in their own country. Um, other have been restricted due to what is seen as indecent in their countries. Prosecution is one of the major steps leading to imprisonment. Actually, we have seen um, a very alarming increased level of almost four times compared to the previous year on prosecution. Um, one of the high, highest um, number of prosecution has been in South Africa, um, that's 32 cases. Most of these cases are related to protests against the COVID-19 lockdown and its policy. When artists took to the streets, many of them has been arrested and prosecuted. In Turkey, prosecution of artists continue in the name of or on the ground of insulting the president or being a member of terrorist organization, especially Kurdish artists have been targets. Others have been on the ground of inciting uh, violence and terrorism. Bangladesh, we continue to see very active the new uh, Digital Security Act continue to be used against journalists and artists alike. Six artists were prosecuted under Digital Security Act, the new law that has been used time and again against journalists and artists who oppose government's policy. In Morocco, six artists were prosecuted mainly under charges related to indecency. Iran, five, and Poland, five. It's, quite, it's important to point out that most of the cases that um, the artists um, and cultural workers being prosecuted in Poland are related to LGBT. Um, this is quite very much related to uh, recent calls by local governments in Poland, uh, the announcement of the LGBT free zone in many cities. The use of detention against artists has continued to be at a high level in 2020. 
This has resulted in creating a climate of fears in many of the arts and culture communities, leading the world to continue to be in Cuba, where 22 artists were detained uh, for opposing governments, including their cultural policy. In Russia, 17 artists were detained, uh, many on the ground of a public gathering without approval of the government. It's also important to point out that Russia has used a variety of grounds for detaining artists, um, including accepting money from uh, foreign countries or sometimes on the ground of corruption. In Turkey, 17 detention cases uh, targeted Kurdish artists, mainly um, trying to silence art, uh, Kurdish voices, um, both when they express themselves, um, their cultural, their history, and their political stance. In India, where we see Hindu nationalism continue to grow, uh, especially at the backdrop of the new Citizen Act, we have seen um, detention of artists and those who voice against the new Citizen Act, as well as on the ground of hurting religious, religious feelings. I'd like now to switch to have a, a quote before we go into the COVID-19 section. It's also important that um, whenever there's crisis, whenever there's situation happening, whether fighting terrorism at one point or now staying together during the pandemic, respect of human rights continue to be an essential part in addressing some of the challenges that we are facing. Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, put it together quite nicely, and I'd like to share this with all of us here. She said, given the exceptional nature of the crisis, it is clear states need to additional powers to cope. However, if the rules of law is not upheld, then the public health emergency risks become a human disaster with negative effects that will long outlast the pandemic itself. This is certainly an important food for thought. So I'll be going to go into how artists suffer during the pandemic or related to COVID-19 cases. So during the year, for cases related to the pandemic directly, four artists were imprisoned in Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia, um, while 48 artists were prosecuted in nine countries. In nine countries. 13 artists were detained in 10 countries. When we look at the ground that uh, artists are being silenced related to COVID-19 case, we found that very often it is they are being charged on the ground of uh, spreading disinformation on the pandemic. And then secondly, for joining protests during the pandemic, where artists use arts and culture to make their voice heard. Other for creating artwork that critical of governments during this particular time. Uh, moving on to the situation of the use of religious rights to restrict freedom of expression. It's also important to remind us all that it has been analyzed and make it very clear that um, restriction of artistic freedom in the name of hurting rel religious feeling cannot be allowed. In one of the interviews um, we found, for example, um, from Samad, Kusat, who said that now in Pakistan, even talking about blasphemy has now been labeled as blasphemy itself. And this show of shrinking space um, for artists and everyone in general to discuss um, religious belief, faith, and express themselves through arts. Um, for a restriction related to religion, we found that last year, one teacher was killed in France. Um, eight artists were imprisoned in seven countries. 21 artists were prosecuted in nine countries and 11 detained in six countries. One of the saddest incidents that happened uh, on artistic freedom related to religion was the um, case of Samuel Paty a French teacher who were beheaded on the streets of Paris for using cartoon of Charlie Hebdo um, to discuss in his classes. This is certainly a terrible incident, but this shows us at least two uh, uh, points. 
One is there's still a high level of intolerance and division in our society. In countries like France, which is often seen as champion for democracy and human rights, um, this division and intolerance tend to be increasing, at least in the short term, rather than decreasing. And one of the main instruments to help address this is education, is exchange, is dialogue, it is the interaction rather than using of censorship and violence to restrict views or to close down views that we disagree with. So thanks for Samuel Patti for showing us the way and we also will follow suit. Um, education, media and dialogue in society is continued to be badly needed. The use of blasphemy laws continue to hurt artistic freedom in many parts of the world as some countries continue to have death sentence uh, for blasphemy, especially uh, in some countries that have a, that use Sharia law in their countries. In Nigeria, the case of Yahaya Sharif Aminu has demonstrated just that. The gospel singer sang one song and posted on WhatsApp. As a result, he received death sentence. His house were burned. He had to go into hiding. He had 30 days to make an appeal, but no lawyers were willing to accept his case. We were fortunate that while we campaigned for this particular case, a human rights lawyer in Nigeria agreed to accept and make the appeal just in time before he was hanged. The case is still ongoing and we will continue to campaign in support of Yahaya. Another form of restriction of artistic freedom has come through the misuse of counter-terrorism measures against artists, very often on the ground of glorifying terrorism uh, or uh, insulting or belittle victims of uh, terrorism or being members of terrorism organisation. And this has disproportionately affected artists from minority background in a significant way. Um, we have looked in and found that at least eight countries have misused anti-terrorism measures against artistic freedom. And these countries are Bangladesh, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Serbia, Spain, USA and Turkey. And in 2020, 43 artists have been affected by this misuse of anti-terrorism measures. In Turkey, for example, Group Yoram, one of the very famous bands, where five members are still in prison. Um, the uh, two members of the band were on hunger strike and passed away last year. Both of them were charged on ter terrorism-related charge. In Egypt, Shadi Habash died in prison last year. His crime was to produce music video for Rami Hassan and others. He was charged on anti-terrorism related grounds. When he died, he was found that there's hand sanitizer in his stomach and medical support did not arrive in time. And this is one of the cases of death in custody, which has continued to be in the high number in Egypt. Women continue to be restricted, their artistic expression and their right to creativity. Last year, we also recorded quite a high number of restriction of women artists. Very often, this come into restriction on the ground of indecency, which account about one third in the past few years. We have also seen increasing attack of women artists when they campaign for women's rights and other feminist issues. Other gender-based violence online and offline continue to grow in so many parts of the world restriction on reproductive rights, protests on abortion laws continue to be one of the um, uh, sticky point for many. While many artists who call and support women's rights have also been targets. Um, for example, Meti Rajabian who also produced an album in support of women's rights to sing and dance. He also become a target from now house arrest in, in, into other form of restriction. We've seen last year 16 artists 
imprisoned in Sudan, Iran, and Egypt because of uh, their call and stand up for women's rights. Four artists being prosecuted in Bangladesh and Iran. Four artists being detained in Congo, Egypt, and Kuwait. And three artists were attacked in Afghanistan, Austria, and Poland. One of the artists who lost their life for standing up for feminist causes and other women's rights issues has been the Mexican artist and feminist Isabel Cabanilla de la Torre died, who basically being shot on the chest uh, while cycling. Her crime was simply because she expressed herself artistically and stand up for women's rights. LGBT artists and LGBT art themes continue to be targeted in many countries around the world. Um, last year, Free Meals launched a report on LGBTI and artistic expression in the city of Krakow in partnership with the city. Um, this is a very much welcome effort. What we found in this report is that whether or not you are in countries with laws or without laws that criminalize homosexuality, uh, artistic freedom related to LGBT are still not safe. We found again this year that 52% of violations actually took place in country with no laws that criminalize homosexuality. That is more than countries with laws that criminalize homosexuality. We stand at 48% in 14 countries. But when we look at the figures in uh, 2020, we found that one dancer was killed in South Africa related to their LGBT expression. Three artists were imprisoned for these causes in China, Morocco, and Russia. 13 artists being detained in Russia, while seven artists were prosecuted in Poland, Russia, and Sri Lanka. One story to share with you is the story of Sarah Hegazi. Um, Sarah is a lesbian in Egypt. Um, she has been waiting for quite some time before she planned to make announcement to the world who she is when the, um, the rock band Mashraila came to play in Egypt. She carried the rainbow flag, as you see in the picture. Um, at the end of the concert, she, among other 70 um, concert goers, were detained. Um, many of them were sentenced uh, into prison. While in prison, Sarah were sexually abused. Um, so while many, a number of organizations have campaigned for her release, um, she uh, later was um, found a place uh, and, and received a refugee status in Canada. While the plan was to start new life in Canada, her post-trauma um, syndrome has caught up on her and she killed herself last year on the 14th of June. Moving to the last part of our presentation, uh, censorship in 2020 continued to be at a high level with 289 cases of censorship were monitored and documented affecting 469 artists, artwork, events and venues. It's important to note the increasing number of um, online events and expressions, especially during the pandemic year. It's interesting to point out that one quarter of censorship is now happening online, including digital film streaming platforms. And this reflects very much on reality during the pandemic where arts and culture have gone digital. Um, the challenges faced when it comes to artist freedom is that uh, social media's company continue to use community standards as criteria for censorship, that is to do what is allowed and not allowed um, to be seen on their platforms. Uh, Free News and other partners have called on social media company to use international human rights standards rather than arbitrarily private company standards, which will affect everyone's right to free expressions. Uh, we also called on social media company to increase 
and grant access to right to appeal when contents are being taken down and also for social media company to promote transparency by declaring the number and reasons for content being taken down and make those information public. Looking at the overall number of censorship last year, we found that the main reasons uh, for censorship continue to be on political, um, followed by indecency or minority related issues stand at 10%, LGBT at 9%, racism at 8, women and religion at 7 and 6 percent accordingly. In this report, we have made a number of recommendations for governments, for UN regional intergovernmental bodies, the media and civil society. We believe that all parties need to work together to realise the right to freedom of artistic expression. But I'd just like to highlight only two that I think really critical. Um, one is certainly the need to address legal framework, which has been the main tools for silencing artists and limited freedom of expression. Many laws are inconsistent with international human rights standards in the first place. Vague wording in anti-terrorism measures and laws, hurting religious feelings, protecting public moral or indecency. These are some of the problematics, challenges, legal framework that we need to address. Secondly, we also urge governments to work with civil society, artists, cultural workers to develop strategy and action plan to protect artists, to ensure their safety and the, of artists and audience. And this will be two important steps that we could take forward together to realise and fulfil the right to freedom of expression. Thank you very much and I look forward to debate and discussions following this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pripat. What an input. These, all, all these documentations of all these violations against artists all around the world, it's a huge work for sure. We will be discussing it in the next, uh, in the next uh, uh, few uh, 50 minutes, I would say. I am Naziha Saeed, I'm a journalist from Bahrain, I, and I am in exile since more than four years. And I am here with you live from Allianz Kultur Stiftung Hedekwata. And uh, we are going to focus on art and, express, uh, and expression freedoms in different parts of the world. We will have today in the discussion via also technology uh, cartoonist uh, Kak, who is working for various agencies uh, in France movie business. Kak rewrote his career in 2014 and became editorial cartoonist for French daily newspaper L'Opinion. In 2019, he also became the president of Cartooning for Peace, a network of 200 cartoonists from worldwide. Also, welcome with me Asli Erdogan, a writer and uh, a writer of literature and col columnist, uh, human rights defender, ex-political prisoner, as well as practical uh, physicist. She is an author of eight books that got uh, uh, translated into more than 20 languages. She was arrested in 2016 for her collaboration with the pro-Kurdish newspaper, Osgur Gondam. Also, please welcome with me, Kuwaiti artist, Shuruq Amin, who is mixed media inter interdisciplinary artist and published Anglophone poet in purpose of instigate uh, positive change in society. Amin explores and express and portrays Arab psychopolitical taboos issues in her art and poetry. Amin's art her regularly has been banned in her native Kuwait but she is resilient and constant to uncensor 
and to deliver the message to defy uh, hypocrisy in Arab society and push hypocritical, diagmatic ideologies toward more tolerant, just, and accepting future. In a presence with me, I have Christian Mia, Executive Director at Reporters Without Borders, Germany branch, advocate for freedom of press, freedom of information, and a human rights defender, and a former journalist. Welcome. I'm happy and honored to have all this variety of uh, cultural practitioners, artists, and journalists with me here today in this uh, virtual uh, stage. Please stay with us over uh, the Alliance Culture uh, YouTube channel and also the website of rewritingthefuture.org and also the Facebook page uh, of Rewriting the Future. I will start with Shurouk today uh, from Kuwait. Uh, Shurouk, Kuwait is a cultural production and highly dependent uh, on religious and moral norms. Art has constantly been securitized through the lens of Islam and public morality. While artists who are vocal about issues related to women who criticize different segments of society, just like you, face censorship and legal persecution. Mrs. Amin, do you wanna share with, the, with us today and with the audience your experience? Well, uh, what happened to me uh, in 2020, it was the second time it happens in Kuwait, uh, for me personally, uh, which is that the Secret Service, the Ministry of Information, Ministry of Commerce, uh, and the police uh, all entered the gallery. I was having a solo show, and they entered the gallery, physically removed the paintings from the walls, um, asked for me, asked, uh, uh, you know, where, where is the artist who did this? Um, and thereafter uh, locked the gallery and um, uh, they were going to wax it with the red wax. Uh, and of course, as you know, as an artist, the gallery is not mine. I have been invited to exhibit there only. Uh, so it was, it's, it, the censorship of my exhibition and my work was having these ripple effects on, uh, on, on, on everyone around me as well, um, starting with the gallery itself. Um, I was investigated. I was, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, I, I was watching the videos earlier and a couple of statements came to mind, which I really relate to, which is uh, persecuted for having offended religious sentiments. And in my case, it was, I offended religious sentiments. I offended, um, the uh, patriarchy, of course. I offended uh, the government for their political hypocrisy. Uh, they called my work blasphemous, uh, back to religion again. Um, and, you know, if you look at any of my work, I do deal with adultery, I deal with religious hypocrisy, political corruption, homosexuality, anything related to LGBTQ community. Um, money laundry, child brides and forced marriages, uh, women in, uh, women's bodies and the freedom of whether we can use our bodies or not, uh, alcoholism in a dry country where there is no alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, and uh, of course censorship topics and the, the problem of the stateless, which is the Bedouin, which are the people who are uh, living in Kuwait, almost 400,000 of them, but have no papers whatsoever. Um, so all of these are issues I tackle in my paintings. Um, being the only artist in Kuwait who has talked about these topics, of course, they're going to single me out. But the thing is, um, when it came down to it, when, when I was actually, uh, you know, legally uh, confronted with this, they could not actually put me in jail. They could not actually find anything within the legal, uh, you know, ramif ramifications that they could pinpoint on me because everything I did was within the constitution of Kuwait. And this is a very gray area because the constitution of Kuwait 
is, is, is a very good constitution, but there is the loophole of it follows the Sharia law. And as you know, with Sharia, there's always the loopholes. There's always, there's always a pathway to get you, you know? So um, I was sort of on this very thin line, like a tightrope. I was walking a tightrope and trying to balance between, you know, uh, legal issues and Sharia issues. And in the end, uh, thank God the legal issues won and I wasn't sent to prison. However, um, there is a different form of uh, persecution in Kuwait, which is underground. So my name is uh, blacklisted everywhere. If you try to publish anything with my name in it, they will ask you to remove me from the book before they, can, they will publish it for you. Uh, I'm not allowed on TV. I'm not allowed on the radio. Uh, I can't show my work anywhere. Um, and uh, this rippled actually to Saudi Arabia because uh, I was um, supposed to be in an auction with a gallery that exhibited in Saudi Arabia. And uh, the, the people there told the gallery owner um, to remove my work from the auction. So it had regional ramifications for me as well. Um, of course, there are personal ramifications uh, with my children being bullied in school, uh, them having to hear words about their mother, very, very um, hurtful, really disgusting words about me. Yeah. Um, my family, you know. Um, so there's, there's many things to get into. I don't want to take up too much of your time with the details of it, but definitely it's... Uh, it's no one else is, is doing it. No one else wants to go through all that. Uh, no one else wants to be watched. You know, my social media is watched by the secret service here. My phone is tapped. It's all underground. It's not, it's not like I'm behind bars, but I, they're trying to, you know, instead of beheading my neck, they're trying to um, stop my voice, stop my vision, uh, sort of, you know, cut off my 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 hands uh, in a way, you that, know, metaphorically uh, speaking. We're yeah. sorry to hear that, but we are sure that you are not silent, and we can see that you are not silent as well. And you are, if you are not welcome to exhibit in Kuwait, then you are welcome here with us today in, in this uh, festival. And also, I'm sure there is other countries that will welcome your art. That will lead us to Turkey, where blasphemy as well is a ground of hurting religious sentiment still pose extreme threat to freedom of expression. Recently, protesters broke, uh, or protests broke out against the controversial administrative appointment at one of the Turkey's most prestigious universities has quickly spiraled into police violence, arrests, and serious threat to, um, uh, it was a serious threat to the President Erdogan's regime. Uh, students at the university are pushing back against uh, the, uh, the regime on campus, but also connecting their pledge to the overall uh, disintegration of democratic norms in the country. Mrs. Asli, for you, this incident is a turning point. How is that? Can you, can you hear me? Now I can hear yeah. you. Okay, great. I'm very bad with technology, no although I'm a physicist in the past. Well, I was a student of uh, Bosphorus University myself, and I was there also academician. I, I spent more than a decade in that uh, prestigious uh, university. Uh, it's American University, and it had a sort of uh, privileged status. I was a student back in the junta years, just right after the junta, and the police never entered. Bosphorus University was untouchable, maybe because it was also not such a big threat in their eyes. It was uh, highly intelligent, uh, well-behaving kids we were. Uh, but, uh, so I think this is a really turning point that such a um, 
innocent demonstration, uh, which is a constitutional right protest, uh, turns into such a show of violence and plus all the other issues like blasphemy on religion and an attack on uh, LGBTI is brought in, almost pushed in because these are not actually, this protest was not about LGBTI rights or anything. It was just against the newly appointed director. So I think this is a symbolic turning point of the Turkish society who's supposed to be uh, secular, or I would say, use the term laic because it's the French model that's implemented in Turkey, not the Anglo-Saxon, has taken a U-turn. We are becoming more and more an Islamic state. Uh, that's what this demonstration and the police violence against it is saying, and you can't even protest your uh, appointed director. That's what they told us. And there was a very symbolic, uh, it looked like an awkward, very amateur installation. But one policeman uh, put uh, handcuffs on the entrance of the university. I think this is the photo of today's Turkey, handcuffs in the door of a university, a very respected university, like our Oxford or something like that. It's a simple. Yeah, it is a very, uh, I think it's very symbolic, but it is uh, crucial. And uh, I mean, Turkey is a difficult country to talk about. It has uh, many conflicts. Uh, and I think the general portrait of Turkey as far as I could judge in the European press, is actually much more positive than it actually is. And I'm thinking about the reasons behind that. Why is, what is really happening in Turkey is so much swept away or even normalized. Uh, what would you expect from Turkey? Well, I grew up in Turkey over 50 years. I spent there, I've seen two Juta regimes and today is by far the worst period I have experienced myself. But this somehow, this message we cannot get to the world. They just don't want to hear But what that's is why happening. we are here. That's why we are here today and you are here today to tell us more about it. And also we will come back to you about this. Uh, also extremist and sensitivity to religious sentiments pose extreme threat to human life with Parisian French teacher Samuel Batty. Beheaded over the use of Charlie Hebdo cartoons, this topic is not new for France. How does these events affect freedom of expression in the French state? Can you tell us more about it? Hello everyone, thank you for having me. Um, first of all, we, we all have to remind that um, Terrorist, Islamic terrorist killings in France and everywhere in the world actually doesn't specially uh, focus only on artists. Uh, I'm going to speak about the consequence of freedom of expression, freedom of speech, of course, but it's a much wider fight. Um, those who use religious ideology and violence as a, as, as a strategy actually want to, to build a war between civilizations, we could say, between um, different ways of seeing how human beings should live together. So it's, it's, it's a fight against, we could say, Western world, again, the whole Western world. And many people who were killed in France and elsewhere, again, had nothing to do with art in, in, in any way. You know, in, in, the, in the Bataclan, uh, which is the, the concert room where 30 or, or more people were, were killed uh, in, 2000, in late 2008, 15, uh, they, they weren't coming to kill the artists on stage. They were coming to kill the audience and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the, unfortunate, the, the, the terrible assassination murder of Samuel Paty is in, in that long range of violence. But it is true that because of the fact that Charlie Hebdo, the weekly uh, cartoon magazine famous now 
in the world because they have become a symbol of um, freedom of speech through cartoons, through humor. Because they have been a symbol, it is true that um, there are often targets for terrorists. Um, everybody heard about um, the horrible, the horrific murder of Samuel Paty, but you have to know that since 2015, on a regular basis, some suddenly crazy terrorist tries to find them. A few weeks before Samuel Spati murder, actually someone attacked the former officers of Charlie Hebdo who have moved now, but the guy didn't know. So he attacked their former officers with a kind of an ax, a meat ax, and, and hurt people who were working there, who had nothing to do with Charlie Hebdo. So um, because they are a symbol uh, they, they are the very and, it, and it's very much about Charlie Hebdo themselves. Although we have other papers publishing uh, cartoons, we have other papers publishing cartoons about religion, uh, but it's always about them because of the symbol they have become. And to answer your question now, very specifically, the consequence about freedom of expression, there is the things that you can see that are obvious. So obviously, the government said we will fight. Uh, we strongly support teachers who want to teach freedom of expression, including using cartoons, including speaking about freedom of expression and religion. All the newspapers published a tribune saying we all fight for that. So that's the visible part. But of course, there's fear. And we're speaking about teachers all over France in their little schools or big high schools or whatever in very different territories, some territories where this is not an issue because religion is not really present. And when it is, um, it's, it's not in a conflictual um, stage, but also territories where religion and specifically the, the Islam, the, the radical part of Islam religion is present. And for these teachers, well, it's nice to hear they will be supported, but they are really afraid because what happens with Samuel Patti technically could happen to any of them because if someone suddenly decides to pick a knife and come and cut your throat, how are you, how are you going to defend yourselves? You know, policemen cannot be at the entrance of every school. So it is true, and I'm almost done for that part. It is true that at Counting for Peace, where we work with, with all kinds of schools to um, teach tolerance, human rights, and living together to students through cartoons, um, we can feel that we really have, even more than in the past, we really have to help teachers to, well, to stand up and to have the courage to keep doing that. It doesn't mean you have every morning to show cartoons of the prophet, Mohammed, of course, but they have the courage of still trying to teach freedom of speech, including about religions in the schools. Yeah. And, and that terrible attempt was a, puts that, that attempt in, in danger. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Mia, RSF or ROG are watching closely the situation of all these countries and also uh, documenting violations against freedom of expression and freedom of press. You have been focusing on some of the big cases that took the, the intention and the, the attention of the world. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Uh, no, on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, thanks for having me. And I'm very grateful being in this launch event with Muse because I think having, uh, listening to the numbers of, of the Muse report that you really see very much how closely linked are the right to freedom of information, right to freedom of the press and the right to freedom of artistic, um, artistic expression because almost all the countries which we heard about are, are countries where reporters without borders actually has to work on. So that's why I'm very grateful because there you really see why actually human rights are universal and that these rights are very linked. But talking about cases, I mean, uh, phew, it's a good question because there are so many huge cases we, which we are working for, on, but maybe I'm talking personally about two cases where I personally were more in, was, was more involved in the last recent uh, months. Is one actually which is closely linked actually to the case of Adli Erdogan as well, because what happens to Reporters Without Borders as an organization actually defending the rights of others to, 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 to use their granted rights to, to a growing extent happens 
important to us as well that we have to defend our own, because in Turkey, our own representative, Ero Rondorolu, who is our long-term representative in Turkey, he faces himself actually um, um, a prison sentence, exactly because of the same thing which Adli Erdogan is confronted um, with, is actually for having taken part in the solidarity action at Özgür Gündem um, newspaper. And I was almost, he has now for five years, since five years he is on trial in Turkey. Um, last year, actually, we already were happy and were celebrating that actually um, that actually the Turkish judicial authorities um, in the end said, okay, you can go. And then then actually um, so the Turkish Turkish courts decided to open up again a case. And, and he is facing a prison sentence because doing his work for Reporters Without Borders because of having taken part in a solidarity campaign. Um, and there you see that us as an organization are as well defending our own. And that's why I think there has been no, I have to say, I think there's no building which I know better in Istanbul than the so-called Palace of Justice in Istanbul, Chaglayan. I, I don't know how many times I've been there, mostly for just being in solidarity with our own colleague Errol Ondorolu, but for lots of other cases as well. And another huge case, because luckily our own representative and colleague is, is not in prison, but he's facing a prison sentence, but another huge case with huge geopolitical political implications is actually the case of the, the brutally murdered case of Jamal Khashoggi, yeah. who has been murdered by Saudi Saudi state officials as well in, in Istanbul, but in the Saudi consulate. And it's a case which is so emblematic for, 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 for several reasons. First of all, because of its brutality. I think there are few cases of, of anybody who I know and who the cases who I personally worked in of someone who has been murdered and killed in such a brutal way. And we know, unfortunately or fortunately, we know so many details about the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And it is a state crime actually having having been ha having convicted by by Saudi government and we try to fight against the impunity in first of all for for actually making the public not uh, forget about the case but as well that that international authorities international judicial authorities follow this case because impunity is one of the major major crimes, I would say, impunity okay. against crimes. And that's why we, on various level, campaigned for the case. We we even traveled to Saudi Arabia two years ago, which was for us a dangerous mission, I have to say, getting so close to a, such a um, regime like the Saudi monarchy, um, the absolute monist monarchy. And we are keep on campaigning f against the impunity of Jamal Khashoggi because we cannot let the Saudi regime go away with their vision 2030, um, describing a nice country which in fact is a brutal absolutist monarchy suppressing freedom of the right to artistic freedom, but as well right to freedom of the press. And the uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi, he is, I think it's very emblematic case and that's why we are working so intensively on the case and me personally as yeah. well. Can we uh, end with Assange case? Julian Assange is a case which I worked as well, which is a difficult case, I have to say, because reporters of borders, we are, if we talk about the Western public, very often we get applause, I have to say. But for the case of Julian Assange, is a case where we face lots of criticism as well. And I think it's good that, and, and there you sometimes see how difficult it was right to freedom of, how it was human rights. Julian Assange, actually the case, he's, He's someone who is persecuted for political reasons because of his contributions to journalism. He revealed with WikiLeaks truths and evidence about war crimes of the United States. He maybe was criticized, he, he was criticized for some personal behavior, but this has nothing to do what, with what is at stake. That someone who's 
persecuted because of his contribution to journalism and he's still at risk for being extradited to the United States and he faces their 175 years prisons. And honestly speaking, I'm sometimes shocked um, about the discussions here in the Western public um, about his case, whether you like Julian Assange or not. Yeah. But uh, that's really not that, that's not what human rights is about. Human rights is human rights are universal and they are yeah. for everybody. And we have to campaign for Julian Assange because Julian Assange is if Julian Assange would be extradited, every investigative journalist all over the world would face the risk of being extradited because of things what journalists should do. And this is revealing the truth, is is um, discovering, investigating the truth, the truth which very often people in power, even in Western governments, dislike. And that's why Julian Assange is such an emblematic and symbolic case. Yeah, it shows also the hypocrisy of the West world where... where you know, when it comes to freedom of expression. The West, there's about. a risk of losing credibility, and this is why the case of Julian Assange is so important, and that's why we at Reporters Without Borders, we have been the only NGO, and me personally, um, um, some days, Involved. not the whole days, really monitoring the whole um, extradition hearing in the United Kingdom. I and mean, honestly speaking, one, one final comment on this, it was really shocking, the circumstances for me. My colleague from UK, Rebecca Winston, she was mostly following it, but I was there for some days as well and I think the conditions for international trial observers they, they were so harsh I felt more welcome and this is no cynicism I felt more welcome in every Turkish um, really show trial than and the UK extradition hearing against Julian Assange because international observers in London in the UK should be excluded and that's why it's it's the case Julian Assange but as well our rights here, I would say, in the West. Interesting insights. I'm going back to Kuwait. Shuruq exhibitions were banned in Kuwait in 2012 and also in 2020. What effect does that uh, attack on your art and on you, uh, and you and on your well-being, and you said earlier, on your family as well? Like, how, how is the effect of all of that on, on the whole situation? Well, honestly, when it first happens, it's terrifying. I was investigated for three months and I was depressed at home for three months. I couldn't go out. I was scared to open my phone and look at my messages. I was scared to look at my email because I was getting uh, a lot of uh, death threats, a lot of hate mail. Um, I had people who came to my, uh, my home and threw rocks at my window. And all I could do was close the curtain and back away when that happens you know your heart beats faster you're in a state of fear but what are, what are you going to do i'm not going to go out by myself and and see who it is it could be some crazy person who's going to attack me physically so you know you're in situ you're in situations that are completely surreal to your normal everyday life and um it's uh it, it's it takes a toll on you psychologically you, you um, don't have uh, you don't have the protection of the security services. Well, I'm on the wrong side of the, <laughs> the the security and the law. So, if I go to the law and tell them someone's bothering me, they're going to say, "Well, if you behave, no one will bother you." You know, mm. so I can't do that. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's 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 very terrifying. My I had to change schools. For my younger children, I have four children. Um, uh, one of them was living in the UK at the time, uh, so she wasn't as affected. But the younger ones, I had to move them to a different school. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it has its, its, uh, its, uh, its ramifications, definitely, psychologically and socially. Even you get to know who your friends are and who aren't. The artist movement, the artist scene in Kuwait, nobody spoke up. Uh, on my side. Yeah, Nobody that's... spoke up. If anything, there was one artist who said, why couldn't you just shut up and let sleeping dogs lie uh, so that the you know eyes wouldn't be on us now? Yeah. Um, that was how they were thinking. They actually thought I was wrong for exposing these uh, taboo topics. Yeah. Uh, um, Mrs. Erdogan, you face trial and still facing court case against you in Turkey. 
alongside with other artists, writers, journalists, and also human rights defenders. How does the Turkish state became one of the leading countries cracking down of freedoms? How do you see it? Well, actually, my personal story started much before that, back in 98, when I accepted to take my column in Radikal as a writer of literature. That was a new offering. And in two years, after two years, I was fired. Um, my life drastically changed. I had all the threats, all the humiliations, the social lynch. And I was continuously harassed by the police, but I was never arrested or taken to court. In fact, all my column writing, none of my articles had ever been taken to court. Uh, I'm basically a writer of literature and I have a quite soft poetic style, even in the most political uh, essays. So that must signal some other change in Turkey. I haven't changed my style. I mean, it is, uh, well, the change came uh, gradually, but speeded up after 2013, the Gezi uprising, which I also took part in. But the drastic change probably came with the 2016 uh, coup attempt. And I was arrested also very soon after that, I think after a month. Uh, and after me, one or two weeks after, was the arrest of Ahmed Altan, a well-known writer and a very powerful journalist. Uh, and then came the arrest of Jumuret, journalist, Taraf, journalist, Özgür Gündem, journalist. So these cases were kind of known. We were all put in the bags of this newspaper or that newspaper, although we are individually or even politically quite different people. Suddenly, like in the, the newcomers in Berlin, you see all sorts of political uh, diversity. This actually happened in Turkey too. Yeah. I was a writer of literature and I was put into prison cell with a linguist who was also a book critic and who had written on my last book, Das Haus auf Stein. Can you believe that we, a writer and a critic ends up in the same cell? I mean, arresting writers is a long Turkish tradition. We have over 168 writers of literature arrested in the last century. 168 is a very huge number. Yeah. Uh, but they were all just like me or like Ahmed Alda, were pinned as because of their association with the with the press. Press is always more looked upon and. Turkish writers as a tradition also work as columnists. But it never stops there. And as the regime gets more and more totalitarian, the circle was extended from journalists to writers, to academicians, to artists, to film directors, to theater directors, and came to a point that no one is really safe anymore yeah uh, um, thank you thank you so much i'm gonna go very quickly to cac uh, about the situation in france between the islamophobic and defending ultimate freedom of expression creating paradoxal argument in the society how do you see this um well the the the, the difficult task we have right now and i'm afraid it's not only about france I think it's a much wider problem, and we see that patterning for peace. Uh, we monitor uh, the threats on, on uh, as you do for all artists. We do specifically for cartoonists monitor the threats all around the threats all around the world imposed on cartoonists. And we have seen that during the pandemic uh, uh, period, the pandemic uh, um, phase, it, the number of threats was increasing drastically. More than 73, um, 73 cartoonists received threats really serious ones or light ones, but still in 2020 only. And why am I saying, I know I have to be short, so I will be short. Uh, why am I saying that the situation is getting even more complicated is that in the past, our, as, as, as fighters of the freedom of speech, 
our main adversary, our main competitors were governments uh, in, let's say, dictatorships or very hard regimes, governments who would use their power, their political power to silence all kinds of opposition. And they would include artists, of course, journalists and cartoonists in the opposition. This is traditional. We always have seen that from the very beginning of cartoons. It's a long history and we keep fighting that. The problem we have now is that um, we also see that from the audience that in the past was supporting us, the public, the readers, part of them are now also becoming very tiny and small dictators on the social networks. Mm. Meaning they now, they now consider that the law is not enough. They want also moral issues to prevail. They want their opinions, their feelings to prevail. And so they start this kind of hunt and sometimes lynching on any artist or cartoonist who has said something, drawn something, made humor about something that disturbs them. So it's a second enemy arriving, like, like the first one wasn't big enough. We now have the second enemy arriving, which is much more subtle to fight in a way because it is less powerful than that, that the, the, the state leaders, but it's thousands of people over there in the shadows, very often with no official name, and who try to just cancel you, cancel your work and suppress what you've said. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult times. So we have to keep the it fight is. on. It is, it is difficult times. Freedom of art, freedom of expressions and th uh, are threatening many places in the world. Authorities using COVID-19 pandemic as a censorship weapon. Others use racism, like what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, while other authorities uh, misuse the anti-terror legislation to uh, oppress minority voices. Mr. Christian Mia, how did the authorities around the world use the COVID-19 pandemic specifically to censorship on the ground uh, fighting disinformation? Uh, tell us more about it. I mean, COVID-19 showed us the good and the bad thing of, of, of human kindness, of human beings. I would say in, in strong democracies with strong rule of law, um, where we actually had some, some measures which were um, in shrink, shrinking liberties, we had strong judiciary. So I just want to start with positive things. But, but in fact, in the, in, in, I would say in the worst enemies um, of press freedom, the worst enemies of right to freedom of artistic expression, we saw that COVID-19 was just another excuse. And I could really travel around the world, starting from Tanzania to Turkey to, I don't know, Malaysia, where COVID-19 to Serbia, we could stay in Europe, uh, to Serbia, where COVID-19 critical reporting got governmental practice um, on uh, tackling COVID-19 um, COVID crisis was just used for imprisoning journalists if journalists have been critical reporting about, about shortage of masks, for example. We know cases from Serbia where journalists have been imprisoned. If, 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 um, if a journalist have been critical reporting about vaccination strategies. We know examples from several countries where they have been imprisoned. So in fact, COVID-19 was just another excuse for the, for the bad people. And Definitely. so as such, I would say COVID-19 didn't change anything. Um, so it just showed the bad and the good things. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, sexism is another tool that the so uh, social and political authorities are using against, especially women artists, writers and journalists. On this stage, there is three women who targeted for their gender when their opponent didn't find logical reason to attack them. Asli, you want to say something about this? We can't hear you. Now it's okay? Yeah. Well, I had uh, two big uh, lynch campaigns. One it was back in 2003, just after, as after I was fired from my column. Uh, the fact that I don't wear a bra was on the front page of Hurriet. And I lost all my status as a writer. I was the princess of Turkish literature. From one month to the other, I lost everything. 
for seven or eight years, I was not invited to a single literary festival in Turkey. Luckily, my books were being translated to other languages. That's how I could survive, basically. But that was the only the beginning. And last year, I am also on court still. I was acquitted. The court case started. As if the, all this is not enough, last year, end of 2019, I mean, and I was in hospital for a severe, sur important surgery. One interview I said, which I just very softly criticized the Turkish nationalism in the education system and the fetishism of all these flags and anthems and everything, was slightly mistranslated. I don't know if deliberate or mistake. And there started a very huge lynch campaign. Within 48 hours, it became a top topic, TT, with over a million people cursing me. I wasn't even aware I was in hospital. And almost all the curses were below the waist level. I was, again, just like in 2003, but this time much more harsher the whore, the prostitute, the prostitute working in Frankfurt. And it, it was a bit ironical. I was around, you know, 42 kilos that time, severely ill in hospital in Frankfurt. And all these uh, comments of my prostitutional career. And as if it was not enough, they targeted also my mother, who is in her mid 70s and giving and uh, her address, her private detail, personal details, wow. everything. I was, yes, they put her in severe danger. I mean, she, only she got over 100, yeah, that's I think very 400 sad. death threats. Yeah, very sad and, to hear. And you know, if I was a man, of course that I would be still lynched, but the level would be different and they definitely. would spare my mother. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, Shuruk. Can you say something about it as well? Yes, sorry, I didn't hear that. No, we are in the same what subject you... of using our gender as, uh, as uh, or sexism against us as, as women. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously in, in my case, uh, being a, a female artist who uh, decided to confront the patriarchy and confront the, the government and the uh, religious powerhouses in Kuwait, that has a huge, um, huge impact on how they react to my work. Uh, maybe if I was a male artist, it would be a different reaction. I don't know, but this is definitely something that I have felt, something that has been uh, spoken about in the country. Uh, by the people who did support me uh, or the organizations that did support me, uh, that um, not only am I a female artist uh, standing up to the patriarchy, but I'm also exposing these men in their secret uh, form, in their diwanias, which is like the, the gentleman's club of Kuwait, um, where they, you know, they have the absolute freedom to say and do whatever they want. I've exposed what happens behind closed doors. I've exposed them at their weakest. I've exposed them at their most hypocritical. Um, so the fact that I did that as a woman, of course, is, uh, um, you know, it multiplies the, the, the punishment for me. Definitely. Uh, as as, um, as uh, Kak and Nash said, with the, uh, a lot of it is subtle and a lot of it is social lynching. Um, not just the government itself or the organizations or the system. ministries. Yeah. I have, there is that, yes, I am officially something that happens on a more subtle level. Yeah, thank you, Shuru. On this note, we come to the end of this discussion and this session during Rewriting the Future Festival. Uh, extremely thankful for my guests and speakers today, uh, cartoon artist from France, Kak, artist and poet Shuruq Amin from Kuwait, and journalist and writer uh, Isli Erdogan. 
from Turkey and with me on the stage, Christian Mia, the executive director of Reporters Without Borders from Germany.